Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element xenon. Let me show it to you here. I have a sample in a glass vial here. Okay, I know it's not much to look at because it's a colorless, odorless gas. We will see this sample later on in the presentation. So let's get back to our slides. Here we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, and I encourage you to go and pick it up to get your own copy. Check out his fantastic website, PeriodicTable.com. Xenon is the 54th element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 54 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as this unique element. Xenon was discovered in England by Sir William Ramsey and Morris Travers in September 1898, shortly after their discovery of the elements krypton and neon. They found xenon in the leftovers from evaporating liquid air. More on that in a moment. Sir William Ramsey was awarded the 1904 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for discovery of a series of noble gases, including xenon. Ramsey gave us the name for this element from the Greek xenos, meaning foreign, strange, or stranger. We get our modern name, xenon. Let's look at how Ramsey and Travers purified the noble gases found on the right side of the periodic table. We are going to ignore the radioactive radon and oganesson just to simplify things. As you move down the column, the boiling temperatures of the elements are higher and higher. Gases can be separated and purified from air by a process called fractional distillation. The first step in fractional distillation of air is to change a container of air into a liquid and cool it to a very low temperature. Don't forget that the atmosphere has lots of nitrogen, which boils at minus 195 C, and oxygen, which boils at a slightly higher minus 183 C. We'll ignore those for now, but they boil out of the liquid air the same way the other gases do. The extremely chilled liquid air is allowed to warm up. As the liquid warms, each element changes from a liquid back to a gas at a different temperature. As I mentioned, we'll ignore nitrogen and oxygen for now, but they work the same way. The first to boil away at minus 264 degrees centigrade is helium. You pipe the helium gas away and save it. Continued warming boils away neon at minus 246 C. You save that off too. Continue on to argon, then krypton, and the portion remaining that changes back to a gas at minus 108 C is xenon. It's the last gas to vaporize since its boiling temperature is the highest of all the noble gases. I'd like to thank Paul Danstep for this short series of slides. Let's say we start with 120 tons of liquid air. That's 240,000 pounds. And it would be a liquid sphere, 44 feet in diameter. So it's a lot of liquid air. Once we've boiled off the liquid nitrogen and oxygen, we're left with the noble gases. Since there's no helium in the atmosphere, which is a whole story in itself, the next most common gas is argon we get 2,232 pounds, slightly more than one ton of argon from our 120 tons of air, or about 0.93% of the original. Continued heating then boils off the argon, yielding only 4.32 pounds of neon, or about 55 liquid ounces from our original 120 tons of air. Neon makes up 18 parts per million of the air you breathe. That means that you take in a bit more than 150 lungfuls of neon in one year. That would take you less than 10 minutes of normal breathing. Further heating evaporates the neon, leaving us with 
a little over a quarter pound of krypton, which forms only 1.14 parts per million of the atmosphere. That's about 10 breaths of krypton, about 35 seconds of normal yearly breathing. Boil off the krypton, and you're left with a minuscule 0.021 pounds, or one-third of an ounce, of our original 120 tons of xenon. Xenon makes up only 87 parts per billion of the atmosphere, or only three-quarters of a lungful, less than one breath out of 8.5 million you take in a year. As we've seen, the right-hand column of the periodic table hosts what we call the noble gases. These are the standoffish elements that really don't want to participate in chemical reactions. Why? Well, electrons are arranged in shells. Each shell has a maximum number of electrons before you create a new shell. An atom with a full outer shell does not want to participate in chemical reactions. The first shell is complete when it's filled with only two electrons. The atom with two electrons is helium. The next shell is complete with eight electrons, and this element is neon. Next is argon, and then krypton, with its eight electrons in the outer shell. Finally, we have today's element, xenon, with its eight outer electrons. Xenon, with its perfectly filled shell of eight electrons, does not want to give away or borrow electrons. It's happy. Our previous element, iodine, with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven outer electrons, will do almost anything to steal or borrow an electron to complete its outer shell to look like xenon with eight electrons. That's why it's so chemically active, along with the other elements in its column of the periodic table, called the halogens, here in yellow. The next element we'll encounter in this series, cesium, is a member of the leftmost column, the alkali metals, here in red. Like cesium, all the alkali metals have only one electron in their outer shell, and at the risk of being anthropomorphic again, they'll do almost anything to get rid of that extra electron to look more like the noble gases. The alkali metals are viciously reactive. Even though the noble gases are very standoffish and don't readily participate in chemical reactions, UC Berkeley chemist Neil Bartlett, while at the University of British Columbia, was the first to synthesize a compound of xenon in March 1962, specifically xenon hexafluoroplatinate, though several other similar compounds were also present in Bartlett's initial results. The cover article of this May 1964 issue of Scientific American shows the reddish precursor platinum hexafluoride gas. This gas is such a powerful oxidizer, it can oxidize oxygen. Neil Bartlett hypothesized that it could also react with xenon, and indeed, you can see the resulting yellowish xenon hexafluoroplatinate compound after the addition of xenon. This was big news. There are other xenon compounds like this. Xenon tetrafluoride, for one. You may have noticed that both compounds involve fluorine, the most chemically active element in the periodic table. Xenon costs about 10 times as much as krypton and about 2,000 times as much as argon. It's a pricey element at about $10 per liter of gas at atmospheric pressure, or about $1,800 per kilogram. 50 to 60 metric tons are produced annually. It's estimated that there is about 2 billion metric tons of xenon in the atmosphere, but it's still one of the rarest elements on Earth. Xenon is fairly uncommon in the universe. It's the 37th most abundant element in the universe by mass, only a millionth of a percent. There is no xenon in the sun. There's also no xenon in meteorites. But in the crust of the Earth, it's the 82nd most abundant element. 
only two billionths of a percent, the least common element that's not radioactive. In the oceans, it's the 54th most abundant element, half of a billionth of a percent. And within us, there is no xenon. This complicated version of the periodic table shows the evolution of the elements through the history of the universe. Here, you see each element square with a tiny chart of its own showing that element's growth over the age of the universe by various processes. Xenon is here. I understand this looks complicated, but let's look at just xenon a little closer. The horizontal axis of this square represents time from the Big Bang to now. The vertical axis shows the proportion of xenon created by various processes. Most of the xenon present today is believed to be produced in supernovae, the yellow area. Note the xenon produced by dying low mass stars, the magenta area, doesn't get started until a little bit later in the history of the universe. This is because low mass stars exhaust their nuclear fuel much more slowly and last a long time before they start dying. Supernovae are very massive stars that use their fuel up quickly and die relatively young. A very small portion that's almost invisible, that green sliver on the top, is produced in neutron star mergers. Earth has retained all of the noble gases that were present at its formation except for helium. At the temperature of the Earth, helium molecules are moving too fast for Earth's gravity to hold them. They're moving much faster than the escape velocity from the Earth, and they leak out of the atmosphere and into the solar system. All helium we have today is mined from underground as a byproduct of natural gas extraction. It's a severely limited, non-renewable resource. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same, 54 protons for xenon, but there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes, and they're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 38 isotopes of xenon, and of these, there are nine stable, non-radioactive isotopes. These nine stable isotopes are found in different proportions in nature, from less than a tenth of a percent to almost 27 percent. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek isos, meaning same or equal, and topos, meaning place, since all these various forms of xenon occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the radioactive isotopes of xenon, these are the longest lived, the ones with half-lives over one hour. We'll talk about what a half-life is in a couple slides. Now, remember I said that xenon has nine stable isotopes? That may have been a bit of an exaggeration. Actually, two of those nine isotopes are very, very slightly radioactive, with tremendously long half-lives. Xenon-124 has a half-life 1.3 trillion times the age of the universe, and Xenon-136 has a half-life 157 billion times the age of the universe. Essentially stable. I apologize for the tiny element symbols and numbers, but it's hard to fit in 82 stable elements in a single slide. Although tin has more stable isotopes, 10, xenon has the second most stable isotopes at 9. Now I mentioned half-life. What is a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any isotope from the previous slides. You'll see why I chose 1,024. 
Hint, it's a power of two, and we're going to be doing a lot of divisions by two. If you wait one half-life, half of your isotope will decay, and you'll have 512 atoms left. If you wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half again as many, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, you'll have about a thousandth of your original amount. By the way, notice there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives. If you waited one more half-life, your remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. Xenon is a dense gas at almost 6 grams per liter of gas. That's about four and a half times the density of the Earth's atmosphere at sea level. I've put up a few more densities for you here, but remember we're comparing a gas to a liquid here, water, and also some solid elements. That's not really a fair comparison. Liquid xenon has a density of about three grams per cubic centimeter, higher than aluminum. Here is a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. Normally when I do this talk, we have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself, but we'll have to wait to do this until we're in person again. Our set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, and magnesium. We also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, xenon's density as a gas is 5.9 grams per liter at zero degrees C, which is actually six thousandths of a gram per cubic centimeter, the magenta circle. So pretty low compared to other elements. Xenon has the eighth lowest melting point, a low minus 111.8 degrees Celsius or minus 169 degrees Fahrenheit. Xenon has the ninth lowest boiling point at minus 108 degrees Celsius, minus 162 Fahrenheit. That's only 3.8 degrees above its melting point of 111.8, a very small difference between melting and boiling. Here's a photo of liquid on the bottom, solid in the middle, and gaseous xenon on the top, all in one shot. The solid xenon is actually denser than the liquid and should be at the bottom. It must have frozen in place in the middle and then the bottom melted out. If we compare the size of the xenon atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The xenon atom is a tiny bit more than twice the size of hydrogen. Those outer electrons are held tightly in noble gases. A picometer is a trillionth of a meter, by the way. Atoms are very small. Here are atom sizes sorted from largest, cesium on the left, to smallest, helium on the right. Xenon is a smallish atom compared to the rest of the elements. In this graph, the vertical axis is the size of the atom, and the horizontal axis is the atomic number of the atom, the number of protons in the nucleus, starting with 1 for hydrogen and going up to 86 for radon. With hydrogen on the left, we see patterns. The alkali metals, the yellow labeled elements found in the leftmost column of the periodic table all have large sized atoms because they all have only one loosely held electron in their outer shell. The magenta labeled noble gases in the right column have very tightly held full outer electron shells. These are the smallest atoms in their respective rows. I've colored xenon blue. Here's the periodic table of the spectra. Xenon has many emission lines across the spectrum. A glowing tube of xenon gas therefore looks purplish white. 
Speaking of glowing tubes, filled to about a 40th of an atmosphere pressure, an electrically excited tube of xenon gives off a purplish-white glow. It's far too expensive to be used in signage, besides which it doesn't glow very brightly at all. I took the sample of xenon I showed you earlier and brought it near a miniature Tesla coil to make it glow. Here's what it looked like. Speaking of glowing gases, a fun application are the beautiful plasma globes you've seen in many places. These typically contain mixtures of the noble gases including xenon, krypton, and neon. Camera flashes and strobes are tubes with a little bit of xenon in them. When a high current briefly passes through the gas, it glows with a bright white color. These come in many shapes, from rings to U-shapes to the more powerful helices. The flash from these tubes can be very short. A typical camera flash will be around a thousandth of a second or shorter. But with careful design of the electronics, the flash can be as short as one-tenth of one millionth of a second. The inventor of the flash tube in the 1930s was Harold Doc Edgerton. He used high-speed strobes to produce many of the iconic photos you'll find in galleries and museums, like the classic milk drop splash, or a rifle bullet tearing through a playing card. Using multiple flashes, Doc could record the motion of someone, like this golfer swinging his club. None of this would be possible without xenon. Xenon flash tubes also made possible the invention of the laser in 1960. Here, we see Theodore Maiman behind his invention of the ruby laser. He was the first person to build a working version. In the middle of the helical flash tube, you see the ruby rod that emits a short pulse of red laser light after being excited by the flash from the xenon tube. From the first laser in 1960, we move to the world's most powerful laser, the National Ignition Facility, or NIF, at Lawrence Livermore National Labs. This laser is so large, the building housing it is bigger than the size of three football fields. Here, you see half of the 192 lasers. Note the people near the bottom, just to get some scale of the size of these lasers. Laser amplifiers made of pink neodymium glass, you see on the left, are energized by the largest flash tubes in the world, six of which you can see in the right-hand photo. These tubes are taller than a person, and there are a total of 7,680 of them, all flashing simultaneously. Quite a light show. Similar to the xenon strobe tubes, these lamps maintain a constant arc between their electrodes, providing a constant source of bright, daylight-like light. These are typically found in video projectors, like the lamp in the center, and theater film projectors, like the lamp on the right. The one on the left is an expensive automobile headlight, often called an HID, or High Intensity Discharge Lamp. These require more costly electronics and ballasts, and are usually really annoying to all the other drivers on the road because of the bright glare they can cause. This is not an arc lamp, like the ones you've seen so far, but rather an incandescent bulb that uses a tungsten filament. These lamps can be filled with xenon gas, which is a very poor conductor of heat. The xenon acts like a blanket that keeps the heat in the filament, allowing it to reach a higher temperature and give off a whiter light. Higher temperature also means the lamp is more efficient, radiating more of its light in the visible part of the spectrum. One last advantage is that the xenon redeposits evaporated tungsten back onto the filament, giving the bulb a longer life. These lamps are more expensive, but they're whiter, more efficient, and longer lasting than standard incandescent lamps. A good combination. Xenon gas is also used as a propellant in ion thrusters. This is not just the stuff of science fiction. 
ionized xenon is accelerated to tremendous speeds, maybe 20 to 50 kilometers per second, and expelled out the rear of the spacecraft. From Newton's third law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, if you push gas out the rear of the spacecraft, the gas pushes the spacecraft forward. Xenon is used because it's very heavy and provides more reaction mass. Here, you see the thruster being tested at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. This engine was used on both the Deep Space One and Dawn missions to fly by asteroids and comets. An ion engine is ten times more efficient than a conventional propulsion unit. The Xenon 100 experiment, deep underground in the Italian Gran Sasso National Laboratory, uses 165 kilograms of liquid xenon in an attempt to detect particles called WIMPs, or weakly interacting massive particles. It's believed these WIMPs may be the stuff of dark matter, making up around 85% of the matter in the universe. A larger experiment, Lux Zeppelin uses 300 kilograms of liquid xenon in the well-insulated doer at its heart. Another massive experiment called Xenon NT will use eight tons of liquid xenon. Truly big science to answer truly big questions. From the big to the small, scientists get to have some fun doing their work too. This is called IBM in atoms. It was a technology demonstration by IBM scientists in 1989 to demonstrate the capability of manipulating individual atoms. Each bump you see is a single xenon atom. A scanning, tunneling microscope was used to arrange and image 35 individual xenon atoms on a base of chilled nickel crystal to spell out the three-letter company name. It was the first time atoms had been precisely positioned on a flat surface. This is the original 1989 picture. Here is a later rendering. As you may have guessed, your body does not use xenon or any other noble gas for that matter. Xenon can be used as an anesthetic, but because of the high cost of the gas, about $300 for two hours of anesthesia versus $10 for more traditional volatile substances, it's not generally used. However, it does produce less nausea and vomiting when waking from its effect than the more often used anesthetics. As usual, we'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about xenon. First noble compound? Hexafluoroplatinate? Making history. Thank you for watching Tales from the Periodic Table. The next program in this series will examine another interesting element, the violently explosive alkali metal cesium. We hope you'll join us. This program, like all Exploratorium programs, is only possible because of donors like you. If you can, help us keep educational content like this free and accessible to all by donating today at www.exploratorium.edu give. Thank you.